Hey everybody, how's it going? So it looks like there is an antitrust class action lawsuit going on. I don't think that this is going to particularly go very far. I'll give you the reasons for my cynicism at the end of the video. So I just want to read this here. It says, short squeeze stockbrokers and hedge funds face proposed antitrust class action. It says here, the Joseph Severi law firm filed an antitrust class action lawsuit today on behalf of a class of retail investors in federal court against 35 defendants, including Robinhood, E-Trade, TD Ameritrade, Melvin Capital, Citadel, Sequoia Capital, and others. The plaintiffs allege that they and other retail investors continue to be injured due to a large overarching conspiracy among the defendants to stop them from buying stocks in the open and fair public securities market. Plaintiffs contend that the purpose and effect of the scheme was to shield hedge funds, venture capitalists, and institutional investors from massive losses they had exposed themselves to due to their highly speculative short-selling strategies. Plaintiffs bring claims under the federal and state antitrust laws as well as other state laws and common law. The retail investors held shares in 12 companies. GameStop, AMC Theaters, American Airlines, Bed Bath & Beyond, BlackBerry, Express, Koss, Naked Brand Group, Nokia, Sundial Growers, Inc., Tootsie Roll Industries, <laughs> I'm sorry, I laugh every time I see Tootsie Roll, <laughs> Trivago and V. Several large hedge funds and investment firms, including defended Citadel and Melvin Capital, possess massive short positions in these relevant securities. Short sellers borrow shares or other interests in corporate stock, securities, or other assets. In doing so, they bet that the price of the securities will decrease if the stock prices in fact drop. A short seller buys the stock back at a lower price and returns it to the lender. The difference between the sell price and the buy price is the profit. Short sellers essentially bet on a stock's failure or decline rather than its success or increase. Retail investors correctly identified that the relevant securities were undervalued. In fact, as the plaints fledge, the short positions were over-leveraged as much as 140%, such that institutional investors could not close their positions. These retail investors that began purchasing long positions in these companies, driving stock prices upward, resulting in great losses to those invested in short positions. Short sellers were caught in a classic short squeeze. When the price of an asset rises, short sellers normally face pressure to buy back stock to exit their short positions and mitigate their losses. Instead, as part of the scheme, hedge funds and others holding short positions publicize the relevant securities as being less valuable than retail investors believed. When retail investors continued to acquire shares and drive prices even higher, hedge funds and others faced potentially disastrous exposure when required to cover their short positions. On January 28th, many brokerages abruptly and unilaterally restricted retail investors' ability to buy long positions, in some cases removing the option to buy shares of the relevant securities while openly permitting them to sell their existing shares or prohibiting users from viewing the tickers for some or all of the relevant securities. Even those retail investors who had queued overnight orders to purchase stock when the markets opened on January 28th discovered that their purchase orders had been canceled without their consent. The coordinated prohibition on buying any new shares of the relevant securities eventually led to a massive sell-off and steep decline in share prices. While retail investors continued to be prohibited from purchasing securities at the reduced price, institutional investors were permitted to buy securities at the artificially reduced price rather than use their financial acumen to complete and invest in good opportunities in the market to recoup these losses in their short positions or paying the price for their highly speculative bad bets. These defendants instead hatched an anti-competitive scheme to limit trading in the relevant securities, said Joseph Severi, counsel for the plaintiff retail investors. It is unlikely that such a widespread ban among brokerages would have been achievable without a concerted effort in violation of antitrust laws. Plaintiffs seek to recover damages, as well as injunctive relief, on behalf of themselves and the proposed class from the defendants. The cases Cheng and Al v. Ally Financial, Inc., case number 21-CV-00781 in the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of California. Now, why am I somewhat cynical with regards to this case? Firstly, the lesson that I have learned throughout my life is that when it comes to class action lawsuits, there are usually two losers and one winner. First loser is the company being sued. The second loser is the person who actually got screwed by the company. The winner is the law firm. I have used that many checks on my refrigerator. 50 cents, 63 cents, three dollars and 75 cents because I got screwed over by Visa or Capital One or whatever the hell else, I, or eBay or something. And the problem there is let's say I actually did get screwed. How is this 61 cent check on my refrigerator five years after the fact going to make me whole again? 
It's a ridiculous concept. Secondly, let's say that there actually was some sort of conspiracy going on. Let's assume that there was. This is something that should be investigated by a law enforcement agency, by the SEC, FBI, you know, something out, somebody out there that actually has the authority to go through and investigate, not simply a class action law firm. I don't see a law firm that chases class action lawsuits whose goal is typically to slap a company on the wrist, slap some money for themselves, and then give pennies to the actual participants in the lawsuit. That I don't see them being the enforcement arm here that would actually change anything. But further, if you read through it, when they're, they're not alleging the, a specific event that is something that could be criminal. So, for instance, let's say, and this is, this is pure rank-ass speculation here, I'm not saying this happened, but let's say we were to allege that someone over at Citadel said, Hey, DTC, how's it going? Hey, yeah, I know you guys usually have like a 2 or 3 or 5% re deposit required from brokerages for securities. Um, yeah, so, so the thing is, we just uh, took a stake in a hedge fund that's getting killed for billions of dollars on GameStop. Yeah, it's horrible. And the, all these kids appear to be on Wall Street bets using Robinhood. You know, you know that, cr that that company doesn't have any money. They don't have a real clearinghouse. So if you were to raise the amount required for deposits, it would force them to stop buying because I know they don't have enough money to allow people to keep buying. So uh, would you be able to just raise the deposits here a little bit? Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much much. If that were to have occurred, I could see that as being something that you could point to. But A, you would have to get evidence of that occurring. And B, they don't even mention it here. They are using the word conspiracy here, not me. And if we are to allege that a conspiracy occurred, the best plot line for the conspiracy was left out of the PR. So as I mentioned in my last several videos, when Robin Hood came out and stopped people from being able to trade, a lot of people assume that it was malicious intent because of their relationship with Citadel that has a relationship with Melvin Capital. Now, the reason that people assumed the worst of Robin Hood, including me, I was one of the people who assumed the worst of Robin Hood as well. The reason that this did not seem believable is because the CEO of Robin Hood got on CNBC and said, we don't have a liquidity problem. That clearly was bullshit because the very next day he started taking on billion dollar lines of credit because he probably had a liquidity problem. So a lot of people assumed, including myself, that there may have been something malicious going on there. But the reality of the situation might be that he wasn't lying about there not being something malicious going on there. He was lying about his liquidity problem. The simpler way to explain this, the Occam's razor to it, rather than it being an evil conspiracy, was just that the brokers themselves did not have the money, and very few of them were willing to just come out there like Weeble CEO did and say, listen, man, we don't have our clearinghouses don't have the money for this. They were not willing to, at 11 o'clock or midnight, get on the phone with some, with some financial press person and explain the entire thing. So people thought that. Now, the only way, let's say that that is what happened. The only way that I can imagine there being a conspiracy at that point is if they were actually speaking with DTC and saying, hey, DTC, can you raise the deposit requirements so that those Robin Hood fucks can't keep buying in because I know that most of the buys are them? Thanks. That is something that could be something that occurred. But A, they're not even alleging it in this document, which really does make me wonder, when you're alleging a conspiracy, you're not including one of the people in that conspiracy that would be the most responsible for this occurring, if this conspiracy actually occurred. But secondly, what is weird to me is that, or just, I shouldn't say weird, but probably ineffective, how are you going to figure that out? How are you going to prove that conspiracy? You are a class action law firm. Where is the evidence? Do you have any evidence? Are you a law enforcement body? So I can see the SEC or a federal law enforcement agency or the police or a Department of Justice, you know, any one of those, I could see them, you know, breaking down doors or issuing subpoenas or saying, we want access to this data. We want access to these phone records. We want access to this office so that we can prove it. I don't see how a law firm does that. I just, it just seems out of place to me that a law firm could do any of this. So I don't see that getting very far. The max that I can imagine them going for is saying this is going to look horrible in the court of public opinion. There's a chance that we win. So just to make this go away, do you want to give us X amount of dollars right now? 
X amount of dollars makes the lawyers happy, but leaves everybody involved with, you know, a fraction of a cent. Now, maybe I'm being overly cynical, and perhaps I'm being overly cynical because any class action lawsuit I've been a part of has gone that way. But this is what I imagine might be the outcome of this. And to be clear, I'm not saying that that type of phone call occurred. I'm just saying that that's the only way I can kind of fathom that type of conspiracy taking hold. And if there's a different way that this type of conspiracy took hold, then I'm just kind of curious, how are you as a normal everyday law firm going to get access to this? Do you have witnesses? Do you have people that are willing to testify? Do you have access to documents that we don't? And if you do have access to all of this, all of this damning evidence that would actually allow you to have a case in lieu of being a law enforcement agency that can get access to this evidence, wouldn't you make some allusion to that in the press release rather than not include any information that leads you to believe that you have a strong case at all? So I am skeptical. And to be clear on this, I would like to see an actual investigation. I don't know if they did a bunch of shady stuff. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe when I say that the real issue here is that the Robin Hood CEO just lied because he's a lion sack of shit, in my opinion, about his liquidity issue on CNBC. Maybe I'm wrong, and maybe that wasn't the only lie. Maybe, maybe there was something else. But I don't see how a class action lawsuit from a law firm that, that sues people is going to be how you get to the bottom of this. This would be like a class action lawsuit against someone for, for murder or something, you know, or, or you know, or, or trying to figure out who was involved in a carjacking, you know, the, the, the police do the investigative work to figure out who did it. And then the lawyers, you know, you, you, you prosecute, you defend that, that, that's what I'm used to. I'm not, I don't see how a law firm could do this type of investigative work and figure things out when much of what you want to figure out is behind closed doors, particularly when it comes to the DTC, which again is not even mentioned in this. And if you're going to allege a conspiracy, by all means, you would need to throw the DTC in there. All of those platforms are alleging the same thing. So it's not even like they're just singling out Robinhood. They are including many other brokers where there is not some sort of direct financial relationship with Citadel or Melvin. So what's weird there is they would need to have some specific knowledge or evidence of direct collusion between the hedge fund in Citadel and all of these other brokers that don't have the same relationship with Citadel that Robinhood does. Now, the only thing that would make sense is if you're including all of these other brokers is including the fact that they stopped trading because the collateral requirements for purchasing those securities were raised and they didn't have the capital to deal with it, which would really beg the question as to why the DTC raised their collateral requirements and whether or not there is anything fishy going on there because the fishiness you have to understand you're you're looking at the symptom you're looking at Ameritrade did this Robin Hood did this they did that but they all did it for the same reason the underlying reason which is the DTC changing the collateral requirements so if you're going to allege a conspiracy between all these people and leave the DTC out of it and not allege that they're part of your supposed conspiracy then I really have my doubts as to whether or not that this is anything other than a way to get a law firm's name in the news. And again, maybe I'm being overly critical there. That, that, that's the impression that I get here. If you're going to allege that there's a massive conspiracy between all of these people, and you're going to leave out the one thing that's at the center, the crystal in Final Fantasy IX, then like, what, what are we doing here? Because again, them changing the collateral requirements was the root cause of these brokers saying, okay, we're not going to allow purchasing on here. So if there's going to be no investigation of that at all, but investigation of all these others, that leads me to believe that the law firm filing this case is actually potentially less knowledgeable about what's going on than random schmucks like me on YouTube. And if that's the case, this isn't going nowhere. To be clear, this is pure speculation. And I could, this th th may just be a badly done press release. Maybe that I just don't understand how these things work, but that that's what I think of this. I've been getting emails off the hook all morning asking, what do I think of this PR? What do I think of, of this class action? And again, every time I see the word class action, I just... I laugh because it, 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 I don't need another 60 cent check on my refrigerator and likely neither do you. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. That's it for today. And as always, I hope you learned something.